software automation is transforming numerous industries and in particular in networking we're seeing more and more adoption in the recent years what is driving this interest in programmability and network automation in general it has to do with the fact of growing demand from the network the more higher requirements in terms of speed and scale devices and a growing number of individuals trying to connect to the network and expectations of faster services for instance deployed in the network have led to a growing interest in software automation it's just not feasible to manage networks how they were managed in the past quite a fair amount of intervention by uh, humans and software automation has become critical not just to keep up with speed and scale but also has become a tool for innovation quite a few uh, operators see software automation as a way to differentiate their uh, service services from those uh, offered by the competition for instance ultimately the goal is to have a network operator that manages not just tens of devices but uh, an individual that can manage thousands and tens of thousands of complex networking devices through the heavy use of um, uh, network uh, automation through software all right so how how was this automation done in the past or what kind of mechanisms were available in the past and, and this is kind of a view of what was common and popular let's say five years ago i would say less and less used these days but there's still a fair amount of networks that are using this uh this legacy manageability uh framework and in the past networking devices were managed through a combination of the command line interface syslog and snmp and uh, this framework had multiple limitations um, in general all these three components were completely siloed they share little if anything uh, at all in common uh, there was very limited availability of structured data in particular cli and syslog did not use uh, structured data the lack of structured data make data difficult to parse um, error prone and very brittle any change that happened on the router it was very likely to also break the implementation of the automation uh, software there was an overall lack of uh, the use of uh, schemas uh, to define the data so it wasn't not always clear the what was the formal definition of the data what kind of types what was considered valid versus invalid data and that's that's where schemas uh, become uh, critical there was also limited uh, standardization snmp had some cap uh, basically was a standard base and mips were uh, standards but when we looked at uh, cli and syslog there was not a clear standardization of those interfaces and in overall there was limited uh, uh, tooling snmp even though uh, it had standards and structured uh, data, um, uh, didn't offer the capabilities to manipulate configuration. The network, I'm sorry, the industry never adopted SNMP as a protocol to manipulate or to uh, manage uh, configuration. And even though it was heavily used for operational data, its use quite often rely on polling, which was a very inefficient way to retrieve data uh, from, the, uh, from the routers so the industry overall is making an effort to move away from this legacy manageability framework and move to a model driven manageability framework in this framework all that can be configured and monitored on the device is defined using a data model these data models are going to be common regardless of the interface the programmatic interface that is used to interact uh, with the device the data models are defined in the yan modeling language and i'm going to give some of the specifics for uh, on on that language for those who are not familiar with it and you would interact programmatically using different interfaces the most uh, common ones are netconf and grpc all data now gets exchanged in uh, structure format so it's machine uh, readable whether it's xml json or google protocol buffers and what we want to focus on this presentation is how we can simplify 
uh, the use of this new framework? And what is the an SDK that can facilitate the use of these data models, the use of NetConf and gRPC, and be able to use multiple encodings uh, in, in a simple fashion, okay? This framework is very rich, it's flexible, it's loosely coupled, uh, but there are a lot of moving pieces and it would be good to have a library or an SDK that make it as easy as possible. And we're gonna see um, um, what kind of SDK can be used. But before we look at the detail of the SDK, let's take a quick look at Yang as a modeling language because again, the entire new uh, manageability framework is based on data models and Yang is the language that is used to define these data models. The data models, are three structures, three data, three structures that define, again, everything that can be configured in the box, everything that can be monitored. These trees are built up based out of four basic components. There are leaf, nodes, leaf lists, containers, and lists. Leaves is basically a terminating node on the tree that has some kind of type and value associated with it, okay? And also has a name uh, associated with it. The leaf list represents uh, data of the same type, um, that is uh, multiple instances of data of the same type. Uh, and uh, the is the used whenever you need to have this in a mathematical sense of a set. So multiple pieces of data that have the same type and have to be uh, unique, okay? Uh, so you got leaf, leaf list, containers are nodes that group other nodes in the data model. And ultimately you have lists that also groups data, other nodes in the data model, but it does that within the context of a key. So you can think of it as a, a record in a database. So again, leaf is a terminating node with a, a type and a value and a name. Leaf list, multiple leaves, so basically multiple values of the same type, unique, so it's, it's a set in a mathematical sense. Container is going to group other nodes, and you got a list that typically have a key. And these four components are the Legos that are used to build the overall uh, tree structure. All right, so that is a very brief overview of Yang. Uh, we're going to see later how the SDK kind of simplifies the use of Yang, so we don't need to worry too much about the, the details of the modeling language per se. So if we use NetConf as a protocol to interface with the device programmatically, NetConf is an RPC-based protocol, so basically you have a, a, a remote procedure call, a, a call, a request sent in XML format to the router and the router is going to send a response. All the messages and all the data embedded in the messages are encoded uh, in XML. And we see here a list of the RPCs that are available. You got get config, edit config, copy config, etc. They allow you to manipulate not only configuration, but the operational data. All data exchange in XML. These RPCs, obviously, I'm just listing, uh, listing here the name of the RPC, but the RPC has multiple arguments that are available in each of the RPCs. So if you want to interact with the devices, you will, in theory, you have to be familiar not only uh, with the data models, but you have to be familiar with all these RPCs and with the parameters of the RPCs. The other programmatic interface um, that can be used to, inter to interact with the data models is gRPC, and in particular, the gRPC network management interface. And it's also an RPC-based protocol. And we have four main RPCs that allow us to interface with the device. A capabilities RPCs uh, to discover the capabilities of the device. A get RPC that allows me to read uh, configuration or operational data from the device. A set RPC that allows me to write configuration on the device and a subscribe RPC that allows me to program the device to stream uh, some data uh, back to me. So those are those are the um, uh, the four based uh, uh, the four uh, base uh, RPCs. And uh, as it was the case on NetCom, each of these RPCs is a set of attributes and parameters that you need to specify to get different behaviors from the RPC. So if you wanted to take the advantages, in principle, if you wanted to take the advantages of this new framework, you will have to understand uh, Yang or have a very good understanding of Yang. You will have to have a very good understanding of either NetConf or, or GNMI to be able to use that framework. 
So what we're trying to do with the SDK, see how we simplify the use of these technologies to make sure that people drive automation as fast as possible. So that's why we developed the YAN development kit. With the YAN development kit, you have an SDK, uh, sorry, an SDK to develop uh, automation applications for devices that support YANG. YANG uh, by, you know, by now has become pretty much a de facto um, modern language for networking devices. So if you're trying to manage a, a, a relatively new uh, networking device, you're gonna find that all these new devices support YANG as a modern language, okay? So this development kit, uh, this SDK is auto-generated from the YANG data models, okay? And it has two very important the first one, it allows or it provides a lot of abstractions. Provide an abstraction for the data models, for Yang in particular. So you're able to use the data models without having to worry about learning all the details of Yang. It provides abstraction for the management protocols. So it gives you act, direct access to NetConf and GNMI and RESTConf if you choose. But it also can hide the details of NetConf, GNMI and RESTConf. We're gonna see that um, I can write all my automation without having to worry about the underlying protocol I wanna use. And it also provides an abstraction for the data encoding. Um, potentially using this SDK, I'm gonna build client applications for automation and, and all the data ultimately goes to the device in XML format or JSON or Google protocol buffers. And the SDK allows me just to manipulate objects in the native programming language of choice without having to worry with that data. Ultimately, is how the data is encoded and decoded. All that happens uh, automatically. In addition to these abstractions, the SDK provides built-in data validation. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned before. The data model defines everything that can be configured and monitored on the box in a tree format. So it specifies all the nodes and it specifies what type uh, the nodes has, what name. So if I deviate, if I create an object and I deviate from the definition of the model, uh, the data, um, the script automatically, or the software that is built with it, whatever software is written with the SDK, automatically it's gonna perform the validation. And I have some, uh, um, a couple of examples where that um, automatic validation is gonna be more obvious. The SDK is available in multiple languages, available in Python, Go, and C++, and it's completely open source. Um, it's available on GitHub, and I have the pointers at the end of the presentation. You can, you can take a look at it. The, the simplest uh, way to get access to all the resources is just go to uh, ydk.io. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> let's uh, take a closer look at the structure of the SDK and the packaging uh, that is used. So you're gonna find in, in, in general, uh, what we consider to be the core package is shown here in the bottom part. And the core package brings a collection of services that have implementations for the different protocols, so implementations for GNMI, implementations for um, uh, NetConf, implementations for RESTConf, but in addition performs all other functions that are um, functions on data models that are not necessarily related to protocols. For instance, there's a service to encode and decode in case I wanna take, uh, um, for instance, a JSON string and convert it uh, or validate it with the model, okay? so. Services in general are it's uh, an implementation of a protocol. That's probably the, the simplest uh, the simplest way to do it, or an implementation of an abstraction of a protocol. Okay, uh, the services make use of providers, so you can have an instance of a service that has different providers or different implementations. An example of this is the CRUD service. The CRUD service stands for Create, Read, Update, and Delete and allows me to manage a box, a device, a router, a switch, using create, read, uh, update, and delete operations, and not have to worry about the underlying protocol. I just specify a provider, and that provider can either be a NetCom session or a GNMI, and the SDK automatically takes care of issuing the correct RPC calls to match the semantics of the CRUD service, okay? At the lower level of the core um, uh, package, 
you have the Path API, which is a low-level API that allows you to make use of models um, using path notation. Okay, so services and providers make part of the core, but where are the data models? The data models actually are packaged as model bundles. Okay, and in these model bundles, you have a hierarchy of classes that completely mirror the structure of the data models. Okay, and this is this uh, packaging allows you to install different mod, mod, uh, model bundles depending on the capabilities of the devices. The device may support different model families or different vendors have different model families. So in this way, you install the core package and those services are going to act on models that are part of the model bundles and you can decide what model bundles you can install okay and you have this structure basically in python in c plus plus and in uh, the go uh, programming language so let's take a look at the, what's inside those model bundles the model bundles is basically uh, classes that have been auto-generated, nested classes that have been auto-generated from the YAN models to match one by one the structure of the data model. So that allows me to instantiate these objects and perform operations on these objects, so services on these objects, okay? The leave uh, or leave list, list and containers become classes and a leaf node becomes attribute of a class, okay? And again, the structure of how these classes are nested is completely identical to how I define the data model. So these model bundles allow me just to instantiate, for instance, the root of a model um, and recursively uh, the uh, model is instantiated and I end up with an empty object that I can populate with the data that I'm interested in. Uh, for instance, let's say the example that I'm trying to configure something on, on my device. So I can instantiate an, a configuration object and recursively the uh, model is instantiated with empty data, with no data, and I can plug the data that I'm interested in. And then I can invoke a service to uh, send that uh, object, for instance, to the uh, to the router, and I have a couple of examples, and that make it more more obvious. Okay, but the key point here is that these model bundles and this definition of classes allows me to just focus on what's important and understanding the structure of the data in the data model. I can completely forget about the details of Yang. Uh, Yang. Uh, I mean, I, I'm talking here about the four key abstractions that Yang has, but if you read the formal specification of Yang, actually Yang is a, is a, can be a rather complex uh, model and language. It has the notion of modules, sub-modules, um, augmentations, deviations, groupings. There are diff all kinds of different uh, aspects that uh, are present on data models. And with this SDK, I can completely forget about learning those the details and I can focus on understanding the hierarchy of the data, which is what matters at the end of the day to develop any automation uh, software, okay? Let's take a look at the validation. I mentioned before, one of the key benefits of the SDK is, is the validation of the data. Because the, the SDK and these um, uh, model bundles are originated from the YAM file, the any software written with the SDK, it gets automatic client-side uh, validation, validation that is very fast and gives you precise error reporting. So if I create an object for configuring, for instance, the interfaces of a device, I start plugging that data. If I try to, for instance, send that configuration to the router, invoking a service that allows me to do that, there's a validation step that takes place there automatically and it will tell me if there's any error on my object. What kind of configuration errors or what kind of errors in general uh, I, can, I can have on my data? Uh, you, for instance, you can have an object that is operational data, operational data uh, or an object that corresponds to a data model for operational data. Operational data cannot be written on a device, can only be read. So if you create that object and you invoke a service to write that information on the router, you will get an exception saying you cannot write that information on the router. So that's, for instance, a simple level of validation that happens automatically for you. 
There's also type uh, validation. So if the data model indicates that a particular node is a string, integer, or et cetera, if you use um, a different data type, when you execute, you get an exception. It will indicate that you have a mismatch in the data type that is expected according to the data model. The data model can also define uh, <clears throat> some constraints on the values. So even though a node is an integer, there may be a, a valid range that is accepted for that integer. Or if it's a string, there may be a regular expression that is associated according to the, the data model with that node. So the value gets validated. If the value does not match the constraints defined in the data model, you will get an exception. There's also um, semantic validation that takes place. Uh, let's take the example of configuring the uh, interfaces uh, of the device. The interfaces typically are defined using a list and the key is the name of the interface. So each interface has a unique uh, name. If you create an object for configuring interfaces and you create two interfaces in that object and you give it the same key name, when you're trying to send that object to the to the router, your script will automatically throw an exception, and you're saying, and it's going to indicate that you have a duplicate uh, key name, okay, allowing you to you know uh, fix the the bug uh, immediately. It also takes care of deviations. What are deviations? Deviations is a term uh, that exists in Yang that allows a device to um, indicate exceptions. So even though a device may support a data model, maybe it doesn't support 100% of the data model. Maybe it supports 90% uh, of the data model. So when the connection is established between the client and the router, the router can indicate what, what are the exceptions that it has in coverage, okay? And if you create an object and you assign a value that you're trying to send to the router and the router already indicated with a deviation that it doesn't support that, you will get an exception indicating uh, or uh, giving, making you aware that the device is declaring that it doesn't support that uh, data and you're trying to send that data uh, to the device. So all these validations, again, thousands and thousands of, of complex code that you will have to write otherwise happens automatically for you just because of the fact that the SDK is auto-generated from the uh, Yang files. Let's take a look at a very simple example in Python. This is an example that you can probably run it uh, without any change whatsoever. Uh, and what it does, it uh, changes the host name of the router, okay? And uh, it does that using a data model, the system uh, data model as defined by the uh, OpenConfig uh, group. So let's take a look at what are the packages that get imported. We see here uh, <clears throat> that we're making use of the CRUD service. I mentioned before the CRUD service, uh, it's a create, read, update, and delete uh, service that abstracts away uh, the protocol that we're going to use to talk to a device. Uh, we're also importing the netconf service provider. So this is indicating that even though all my code is going to be written in terms of CRUD operations, ultimately I want to connect to the box using netconf. And I import the open config uh, system uh, data model. Okay. So um, let's see here, we instantiate the provider. That's the first step that we take on the script after importing the modules. We instantiate a, a, a netconf session. We provide the address and the credentials to connect to the device. Then we instantiate a CRUD service. All right. And we get into the data manipulation now. We create the system uh, object using the open config system um, uh, model. Okay. And I'm going to end up with an empty empty uh, representation of the of the model and then i'm going to go under system that config that host name and i indicate the host name that i want this path is exactly the path the hierarchy defined in the data model system config host name okay system in yang notation for those of you who may be interested in that uh, system is a container in yang terms and config is also container in Yang terms, okay? And host name is a, is a leaf. 
So system gets translated into a class that is nested, that has a, another class nested inside a config and host name is the attribute of the config class and we're setting that to, to Europe, okay? Then once we have the data ready, uh, we call the create operation of the CRUD service, invoking uh, or making use of the provider that we that we defined before the netconf session and passing the system object. Okay, that has the data that I want to send. So there are um, a number of steps that happen uh, at this point. The first thing is that the script will validate the data has to make a, a, an assessment of whether system config hostname, assigning a string to that uh, attribute is valid or not. Uh, in this case, hostname is, is in the data model defined as a string, so this is valid, okay? Uh, <clears throat> then, because the provider is netconf and all the communications in netconf are done with XML, that system object will be converted to an XML string. Okay, then because we're trying to perform the create operation the create, uh, with, a, with the netcom provider, uh, the create operation is going to be converted to an edit config RPC in netconf. Okay, and that system data that was already converted to XML is going to be inserted into that uh, RPC. The RPC will be sent, the edit config RPC. We will wait, or the script will wait for the OK to come back. Uh, at that point, it will decide whether the device that it's talking to requires a commit or not. In, in NetConf, some devices require a commit to make changes effective, some other ones do not. The script automatically discovers that based on the capabilities that are exchanged when this provider was instantiated. When this session was instantiated, the router would have um, indicated whether it needed a, a commit or not. So if the router needed a commit, uh, this grid also will take care of sending the commit and waiting for an okay to come back, okay? So if you look at this script, this script is making use of NetConf, is using uh, heavy use of XML, is using uh, having, uh, making use of Yang, and none of this code, I have to worry about the specifics of Yang. I didn't have to worry about the specifics of NetConf. I didn't have to worry about the specifics of XML. I just need to understand the structure of the data model, the data that I want. I want to create my object. Then I invoke the operation that I want on that object. So this dramatically simplifies, uh, simplifies running the code, plus we get all the data validation um, that I mentioned uh, before. So how can you get started from flavor of YDK, which is the one that is most uh, popular? Uh, the first option that you have available is to install it on your system. You can uh, <coughs> install it uh, on Mac OS, or you can also install it on Linux. If you want to install it on Linux, we have installations available for uh, Ubuntu, and we also have uh, installations available for CentOS. You can install it from the Python package index. It's also, um, all software is also available on GitHub, so you can install uh, from source uh, using GitHub. Uh, but the recommender would actually use uh, PyPy. Um, we have a repository, YDK Py samples, that has a lot of examples. So I would recommend if you install it on your system, it's always good just to clone that repo to get a lot of examples and get familiar um, get familiar with uh, how YDK works. If you don't want to install it on your system, you can use a, a, a virtual environment. We have two flavors of them, one based on virtual machines and one based on containers. So for virtual machines, you can use Vagrant with VirtualBox, okay? So if you have those on your system, if you go to the YDK Py samples repository, you will find the Vagrant file that is needed to Initiate uh, a virtual machine. Uh, with this approach, you have a, an Ubuntu um, Ubuntu uh, virtual machine that has uh, YDK pre-installed. 
If you don't want to use virtual machine, you can use a container, uh, you can use Docker, and you go to Docker Hub, you look for the YDK uh, Docker containers, and you can get started uh, with that approach. The last one is a hosted uh, or a cloud-based uh, alternative that you also have available. If you have access to thecloud.cisco.com, for that you need to have a, a cisco.com user ID, but those, those should be um, uh, pretty much available uh, for any user with registration. You can um, make use of the YAN Development Kit Sandbox that is available in the catalog. And that will give you an Ubuntu uh, um, box and two Cisco iOS XR devices. So you can use those devices to configure or read data programmatically uh, using YDK from the uh, Ubuntu uh, machine. So those are the three options that you have. Again, you can install it on your system natively. You can use either a virtual machine or a Docker container, install a virtual machine or a Docker container or uh, you can use a hosted uh, setup on uh, the cloud um, that Cisco that come. All right, so now it's uh, demo time. Let's see it in action. Some of the code that I showed before, I actually did um, some changes to make it more, more complete. So I modified that script that I showed uh, a few slides uh, before. So, uh, instead of having a, a host name hard coded that are gonna that is gonna be written on the box, the is gonna take it as an argument. The script takes it as an argument, and also has the option to either read the host name or write the host name. Okay, and you can talk to the box using either netconf or gnmi. The example that I had before was always writing the host name. The host name was hard coded and was also always using netconf. So with this uh, script. I can choose whether I want to read, read whether I want to write uh, the host name, um, and I can choose whether I want to use netconf or gnmi. It uh, is vendor neutral because it uses the open config system data model. Is protocol neutral? <coughs> excuse me, because um, it uses the CRUD uh, service as an abstraction of the protocol. And it's also encoding neutral. I don't. I don't need to worry in my script to deal with the details of XML, JSON, Google protocol buffers. All that happens um, automatically. So let's take a look at that. Let's go to the box. Okay. So first of all, let's take a look at what I have installed here. All right, so so we we're going to be using version eight five, and we're going to be using open config data model. So we have this bundle um, uh, bundle. This is the model bundle for uh, open config, and this is the core uh, package that we're going to be using. Okay, so uh, the name of the script is host uh, host name. So let's try to, uh, as I mentioned before, the script uh, um, uh, takes some arguments from the command line. So the first thing is uh, it takes as an argument the device that you want to talk to, the device where you want to read the host name from or the device you want to write the host name to, okay? Uh, you specify the device as a, as a URL, okay? By default, if no other argument is specified, uh, the script is going to read the host name and it's going to read it using netconf. If you want to write the host name, you need to provide the right um, argument. And if you want to change the protocol, you need to specify the GNMI option, okay? In addition to these two uh, arguments, uh, we have a verbose option to see the logs, to see the details of what's, uh, what's going on, okay? So let's run it first, uh, just reading uh, the current host name of the device. And this is a device that I had available at the moment. So um, I'm just gonna specify the device. So again, by default, it's gonna use netconf and by default, it's just gonna read uh, the host name. Okay, so it comes back and it tells me the host name is uh, ASBR, uh, ASBR1, okay? So before we go into more uh, detail before we try to execute it with different arguments. What I'm going to do is just take a quick look at, at the script. 
and you're going to see a lot of commonality to uh, commonality with the example that I that I uh, um, that I provided a few slides ago. Okay, so this is kind of the bulk of the of the script. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me uh, maybe go to the to the beginning. These are just comma comments. Okay, so key things that uh, <clears throat> that we're doing uh, here. Uh, we're importing the CRUD service, we're importing the GNMI provider, and we're importing the uh, NetConf uh, provider, okay? So let's take a look at uh, some of the logic. So if the user specified uh, the GNMI option, we're gonna make use of the GNMI provider. So we're gonna instantiate uh, a GNMI provider and store it in provider. Otherwise, by default, we use the NetCom provider, okay? So this is all the logic I need for the rest of the script to function for both GNMI and NetCom, okay? So uh, after we decide what is the provider that we want, we instantiate uh, the CRUD service that again is gonna give me that abstraction on top of the protocol, okay? After I create the CRUD service, I'm gonna check whether the users uh, specify the right argument, meaning that they wanna write a new host name on the router. If they wanted to write a new host name on the router, I create uh, the object from the system uh, data model and I go under system compose name and I assign the value specified by the user, okay? After I populate the data, I call the create operation with my provider. At this point, I don't care if that provider is GNMI or NetCom, the logic is the same. And I pass my system object, okay? Um, this create uh, is going to implement the, first of all, it's going to trigger the validation and it's going to create the right RPC depending on the provider. And it's going to trigger the, the, the proper encoding of the data, again, depending, depending on the provider. If the provider is XML, this is going to create an edit config XML RPC and it's gonna convert the system to XML. If the provider is GNMI, this create operation is gonna create a, a GNMI set RPC, and it's gonna convert the system object to, JSON, uh, to a JSON string. And all that is gonna happen automatically. Nothing in this code uh, has to, in this code, I don't have to worry about converting data to JSON or manipulating JSON. I don't need to worry about protocol buffers. I don't need to worry about XML. I don't need to worry about the, de excuse me, the details of how these RPCs are, 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 are formatted or structured. All that is handled uh, automatically. I don't need to worry about the validation of the data either, okay? If the user did not specify the right argument, meaning we wanna just read the host name, so what we do, we instantiate the uh, data model and we invoke the uh, read operation with the provider, okay? Again, uh, the CRUD read is gonna be translated to uh, um, netconf uh, get RPC if the provider is set to netconf or to a GNMI get RPC if the provider is GNMI. And the data is gonna be stored in this object. And um, that, in, that includes the validation of the data and also converting the data from XML to the Python object or JSON to the Python object, depending on the type of provider. All that happens automatically. And after the data is read, we're basically invoking this path in the model to print uh, the host name uh, that the router has, okay? So again, this is the write operation, this is the read operation, and here, um, uh, before this, I decide whether the provider is gonna be GNMI or NetCom based on the argument passed by the user, okay? So let's go back, again, we run this um, version of the script, which 
was basically the default behavior to read the hostname using netconf. But this time, let's do it with a variation. We're going to pass the verbose uh, flag so we can see what's happening in the background. Okay. So we see all the logging. Okay. So we see that uh, the read operation of the CRUD service got translated to a get uh, RPC. And we see here the reply that came back from the router with the data. And we see all the data that was read back. Okay, and this data in XML is being converted to the XML object. We see here the host the host name uh, data coming back. Okay, all this is validated and automatically uh, converted to the uh, uh, to the Python uh, object. And this is the uh, the output uh, of this of the stream. Uh, sorry, and the output no, the output of the script. Okay, so. Let's now provide the right um, argument. So let's not just read. In this case, we're going. We want to define a new um, and let's let's call it. Let's say we want to rename the host name. Uh, we want to change it to Europe from ASBR one to something that is more meaningful. So let's specify it as Europe. I still have the um, verbose flag. So we're going to see how. Uh, the script now instead of doing the uh, read crud read it's going to do crud create and how that gets converted to a completely different uh, netconf rpc okay so let's take a look at this okay so here we called it with the with the host name and we see that now it's an edit config before uh, it was a get uh, RPC, and here we have our object. Here we have our object converted to an XML string, embedded in an edit config RPC. Okay, this object was validated. The fact that we made it this far it means that the object was validated successfully. There was no errors. Okay, here's the RPC sent to the router. The router took that data and is replying that the data is okay, but the change is still not effective in this particular device. This device requires a commit. So here's the script uh, sending a second RPC with a commit message, asking the router to make the change effective. And then we get the okay uh, from the router. Okay. So if we invoke, um, if we invoke, Let's say, let's remove the write operation and let's now invoke it with the uh, GNMI. Let's see what happens. We read the host name and now we read it with GNMI. Okay, and we got Europe. So we effectively uh, modified uh, the host name and now we read it with GNMI. So let's verify, let's see what. <clears throat> how the messages look in the background okay so now we're reading with gnmi and we see that um mm, the uh, crud cre uh, crud um, read got converted to a get uh, gnmi request we see the encoding here G I uses uh, protocol protobuf uh, encoding for the messages. So this is the decoded uh, protobuf message. And we see here the response that come back, the notification with all the data, the JSON data, the data of the data model encoded in uh, JSON. So GNMI is a little bit different in, um, in NetConf. The RPC is XML and the data is uh, XML also. In the case of GNMI, the RPC is protobuf and the data, uh, it's um, uh, JSON, okay? And we see here that the router effectively was changed to uh, Europe, the host name, and we can see it here in the, in the embedded uh, JSON too, okay? The last thing I wanted to show is, is it's kind of force uh, as a little bit of a hack uh, with how the script is, is written, but I wanted to show uh, mm, the validation, I wanna force an error, okay? A validation error. So let's say <clears throat> I have a bug in my script. 
So instead of uh, passing the arg, uh, right or the right argument uh, provided by the user, I made a mistake and uh, I'm setting the oops. I'm setting the uh, host name to 100, even though the data model is a string. So giving it an integer value should be invalid, okay? So let's say I'm executing my script, okay? So we're gonna execute it and let's say we wanna take the router back to ASBR1, okay? Uh, and I, I ask for give, show me all the RPCs, all the messages, right? That's what we do with the verbos to the same router, okay? Let's see what happens. We see here, there's no RPC. We don't see any XML messages sent to the router. What we see is an exception that tells me that there's a model error, invalid value 100 for host name, get integer and expected uh, string. So we see here the automatic validation kicked in and it validated the data locally without sending anything to the router, okay? If we go back, remove that line. Let's go back. Uh, um, and uh, we run it again. Now we see the messages. And now we see that we're sending the new name or we're sending the host name back to ASBR1. And we see that we get the OK uh, back from from the router, okay? All right, so let's go back uh, uh, really quick um, uh, after the demo and, and let's review some of the resources uh, that are available. So um, all the resources that I'm listed, list, uh, listing here pretty much are accessible from ydk.io. So if you have one URL that you wanna remember, probably ydk.io is preferred uh, URL. If you're looking for uh, samples, you can go to YDK Pi samples that I mentioned before on GitHub. There are over 700 examples. Um, for sandboxes uh, on dcloud.cisco.com, I mentioned already that you have a pre-install Ubuntu machine um, with all, all of YDK plus two Cisco iOS XR routers. Um, that you can make use of the Vagrant box uh, that is on the YDK Pi samples uh, repo to get a virtual machine. And there's also the um, uh, Docker, I forgot to enumerate here, sorry about that, the Do Docker Hub um, uh, containers. So those are additional things that you can um, use. For support, I uh, would encourage you to go to the community, the YDK community. Um, there's a Number of users that you're gonna uh, that you're gonna find there. Plus, all the contributors also join the uh, uh, support uh, community. Okay, uh, for documentation, uh, these are the URLs where you can find the Python, the Go, and the C++ documentation. This is the list of uh, repositories, source repositories uh, that you can uh, that you can check um, uh, for Python, for Go, and for C++. You can obviously, as I mentioned before, you can install from source, but in the case of Python, it's just to make use of the uh, Python package uh, index. Here are some additional recordings. Um, uh, there's actually some demos that I've done, some longer demos that I've done in the past that are also available on YouTube. So here's some additional material uh, related to YDK that you might find uh, useful. So you you can go and take a, take a look at that. And we have arrived at a destination. Really quick uh, summary. We talked at the very beginning and we saw how uh, software automation is becoming critical uh, for networks today to keep up with the speed and scale uh, that is needed. Um, we saw how um, networks are evolving to have a model-driven programmability framework instead of the old legacy manageability framework that relied on uh, CLI, Syslog, and SNMP. And we saw the details of how YDK provides an, an SDK to dramatically simplify the development of automation applications as long as the device supports uh, Yang uh, data models.
The SDK provides uh, strong uh, abstractions for Yang and its data models, abstractions for the protocol, and abstractions for the encoding and decoding uh, functions needed to manipulate data. You have built-in uh, data validation and multi-language support uh, packages in Python, Go, and C++, and it's completely open source. And we do welcome uh, contributions from other people. So please get engaged in the community. And if you have any suggestions, issues on GitHub, welcome or, or uh, contributions also uh, more than welcome. If everybody has questions, again, go to the community or you can reach me directly at uh, 111 Pontes on both uh, Twitter and GitHub. So thanks, uh, thanks uh, for joining today and I hope this information was uh, useful and hope uh, to hear from you uh, directly or through the community. Thank you very much.